All right. Hello, everybody. Good morning, good afternoon, wherever you may be. I am Emily Gilpin. I'm the managing director of National Observer's First Nations Forward series, a series dedicated to stories of success and self determination. Um, we organized this live stream at the last minute because we want to in with Kenahus Manual and find out what's going on. Uh, Kenahus has been a big part of Tiny House Warriors and Tiny House Warriors Village, uh, camped out at Blue River, uh, raising attention on ongoing construction for Trans Mountain Expansion Pipeline, as well as the and camps and construction activity uh, that's associated with that. So Kenahus, I'm just going to let you take it from here and just give folks an update. Where are you? Um, and what's going on right now? Uh, hello, can you hear me? You can hear me good? Um, yeah, I'm here at Sukhotmuk Uluk and I'm a part of the Tiny House Warriors. Again, my name is Kanahus Manuel and I'm the granddaughter of the late Dr. Grand Chief George Manuel, an international um, leader and, and freedom fighter, indigenous rights defender. And I'm the daughter of the late Arthur Manuel, also uh, international freedom fighter for our people, Indigenous people. I'm right here now in Sukhotmuk Uluk. Sukhotmuk Uluk is 180,000 square kilometers of unceded land here in so-called British Columbia, Canada. Um, we are from the largest of the Indigenous nations here in British Columbia. And today we really want to address some very urgent concerns that we are facing on the front lines. We've been occupying our lands since July 2018 at this exact site at Blue River, the site of where a thousand man Trans Mountain Man Camp is proposed. Um, these man camps house uh, pipeline workers um, for the oil and gas industry. And the site we're at right now is actually stopping a thousand man man camp. And we've been there for two years. Um, since day one, we've had an uh, onslaught of racism um, by the local community, and we're still seeing this onslaught of racism um, coming to our front gate and our door and our safety barricades that we have erected. Uh, when we first moved to Blue River, we moved with three tiny houses on wheels. They're built on trailers, and we built these tiny houses to put in the path of the Trans Mountain Pipeline as Indigenous land defenders, we know we need to house our warriors on the front lines and our frontline land defenders. And we moved with three tiny houses. Um, but I'd like to like go back to like when we first launched our tiny houses, we moved them to a place called the North Thompson River Provincial Park. This area is the site of a, a major pit house village site of our people, of our Sukhotmuk people. And there's 30 pit houses within that park um, area. This is all unceded land, let me remind you. And the proposed Trans Mountain Pipeline wants to cut through that pit house village site there at the North Thompson River Provincial Park. And we moved the tiny houses there and launched it with a tattoo gathering, uh, uh, indigenous traditional tattoo gathering that's linked to the land defense, that's linked to the symbols um, of the land. And we were successful in bringing attention to Trans Mountain and but two weeks we were there occupying that land and then the RCMP moved in and made an arrest of myself and threatened to arrest my mother and my sisters and all of the other Sukhotmuk land defenders that were at site. And we moved the tiny houses and that's why we built these tiny houses on wheels so they can be moved to our territory. The 518 kilometers of our territory is being threatened by this pipeline wanting to pass our lands. And we moved these tiny houses from that point where they threatened us for more arrest there at Clearwater. And we moved it up north along the pipeline path to the area in Blue River where they have this site proposed for this man camp. We've been there, we wintered it there um, two winters. It's extreme winter mountain weather. And <clears throat> From day one, we've had racism at the hands of the local community and residents and really pro-pipeline um, pro, pro people that are really pushing the pipeline in this valley. And we're opposed to the pipeline. As Sukhotmuk people, we have the right to say no to these um, projects like the Trans Mountain Pipeline. And we have, we've organized Sukhotmuk Uluk assemblies on the land there at Clearwater 
to bring together hundreds and hundreds of Sequatmook people to make decisions about our land. And we passed the declaration Sequatmook against the Trans Mountain Pipeline um, Declaration. And you could find that online on our Sequatmook Ulu page. Um, what's happening now is there's um, white Canadian citizens, civilians in the area that are organizing rallies against us. And this on Saturday, coming up tomorrow will be actually the 10th rally that they've organized against us being on the land. I mean, we are Sequatmook people asserting our Sequatmook laws, living on unceded Sequatmook land, but we have mm -hmm. white settler um, European descendants um, protesting us. And mm -hmm. so this is what we call um, a very racist society where you can have mm -hmm. white people from Canada protesting the indigenous people living on their land and asserting their Creator given rights, our inheritance to our lands. Um, this title. I thought Canada so was a nice, polite country. Pardon? I thought Canada was a nice, multicultural, polite country. Yeah, well, you see that in Canada. You see that in Vancouver, you, maybe. You see that in Toronto. No, Montreal. sarcasm. I'm joking. <laughs> yeah, I know, but I'm just saying that's Canada. Once you go out of those cities, that the real Canada is exposed. Right. Once you go into right. Thunder Bay, once you go into Kamloops, once you go into mm -hmm. Merritt. Once you go into mm. Prince George, that's real mm. Canada. That's mm -hmm. when you're going to see the real racism um, mm. and the white supremacy that, that we face as Indigenous people here in this country. I mean, we call this the deep north here, just like yeah. the deep south in Mississippi and Alabama during the times when they were um, um, desegregating, you know, mm. like they were trying to keep the Blacks from, from coming into their stores they were stopping the blacks coming into their schools. And that's exactly what's happening in the deep north is that these businesses up here are denying us service, basic service mm -hmm. where we could go into any store in Canada and get service. No, not at Blue River, not in Clearwater and not at Belmont. They're mm -hmm. actively campaigning businesses. Pro-pipeline um, activists are, are actually you know, campaigning these businesses not to serve us. They posted pictures of myself on community Facebook pages for Blue River, for Clearwater, and have denied to serve me multiple times at multiple restaurants and stores. Mm -hmm. I don't need to depend on them for anything, but I have a right to go and be served mm -hmm. wherever. And since the hate attack that happened, uh, there was a, a very serious hate attack that happened at our camp on April 19th, 2020, this year. And we had um, three white males and one white female come to our camp and tear down our barricade, tear down the red dresses, the red dresses and the memorial for the murdered and missing indigenous women because we're fighting man camps that are linked to murdered and missing indigenous women. We have a right. monument and memorial um, of red dresses all around our encampment and people come to our camp to hang red dresses. And they say, mm -hmm. when you hang these red dresses, the spirits of the missing come into them and we can help find them. And so we take this very seriously in our ceremonies. Mm -hmm. And these men came and tore down this whole monument and they knew exactly what this was for. They yeah. came to terrorize and to us and assaulted one of the camp members. I mean, they triple banked him, really. They, they, it was unfair that they did this and they came and they stole my, the, stole the cap truck, tiny house warrior cap truck that we used to haul these tiny houses and rammed one of the tiny houses and, and left the car damaged and rammed into a telephone pole at our, at our front entrance. And since then, the hate has continued. And I, I say this because this hate conjures up other hate. This hate encourages people to yeah. show their racism blatantly. And we see that, that with Soatin. We see that every time Indigenous people stand up to fight for the land. Um, the racism is always there, but it mm -hmm. exposes themselves and people feel comfortable to start to show the racism. And that's mm -hmm. what we're seeing at Blue River. It's coming out um, of the woodwork and cut it, coming out of the, the wood. Okay, you're back. Good. Hi, could you hear me? Could you hear me now? Yeah, yeah okay. Um, yeah. Just to pick up where I, I left off, um, we're continuing to um, face a lot of hate from, from people who are really upset at us being on our territory. And they're saying that 
because of our presence, it's causing um, strain on the local businesses in the area. But we already know that COVID-19 and this epidemic and the, this pandemic has really caused a lot of strain on a lot of businesses. And they would never complain for the whole two years that we've been on site. But now they're now since the pipeline is amping up and they're, you know, pushing construction, this is when we're going to start seeing people publicly coming out against us because they are dependent on the work that's coming through a lot of the, the white people in the area. So we've got um, a rally that people are organizing against us and that's happening tomorrow. And there's going to be people, so Kwatmuk people and elders coming and then we're gonna be doing ceremony, a sunrise ceremony. They're at our front line and um, we're going to pray for what we're doing here and that's for the protection of our lands and protection of our people um, so that there is no um, no one injured in any type of violence that may, may be come against us um, some more because they continue to bring this violence to us. I mean, for the past five days in a row, we've had men, white males, breach our safety barricades and come into our Sikwapmuk safe zones that we have established. Mm -hmm. um, we are actually blockading a road called Myrtle Lake Road and Blue River. And this, this road actually doesn't stop anyone from going anywhere. There's a shortcut to, to Myrtle Lake where this road goes to. And so we're not actually blocking anyone's access from going anywhere. We're blocking Trans Mountain Man Camp from being constructed. And so that's, that's where we're at. And we say that this blockade is where we confront colonial laws where we confront colonial jurisdiction and where we co confront colonial values and ideologies too, because we have to educate people about the reasons why we establish blockades as Indigenous people. Why do we establish them? Um, we have to continue to educate people. Why do we escalate our, um, these conflicts with the government? Because we know that that's the only way we're going to get anything. My dad, my late father, he had always say to us, his daughters and his sons, you're not going, they're never going to give your land back. You're going to have to fight for it. Every square inch of that land, you're going to have to fight for it. He would say they have interest, they have economic interest in every single tree, every single rock, every single grain of sand in our territory. They have some type of economic interest in that. So when we stop that and we confront them and say, no, you don't have consent, there is going to be conflict. And we confronted um, federal agents that had come years ago, even when my father was alive. And I forget the name, Eford. His name was Eford and it was the e federal Eford report that went along the whole pipeline corridor. The very first sentences in that federal Eford report on the safety of the Trans Mountain Pipeline was, we are doing this to avoid conflict and confrontation with the Indigenous people. So right off the bat, they knew that there was going to be, there was going to be confrontation with us as Indigenous people and that they've been manipulating um, leader, like elected INAC leadership in order to show that there's consent for this pipeline, but they're already bought and paid for by Trans Mountain. These these INAC chiefs in the Sukhumuk Uluk are bought and paid by Trans Mountain. They sign money, cash money deals that don't allow them to speak against Trans Mountain, that don't allow their band membership to protest against Trans Mountain. That's why you don't see Kamloops Indian Band publicly supporting Tiny House Warriors. That's why you don't see Simp Indian Band publicly supporting Tiny House Warriors. They should, because we are fighting for our title and rights for them as well. We are praying to stop this pipeline for their generations to come. We are blockading to stop a man camp so our Sukhwatmuk women and girls are not harmed. We're doing it for everybody. We're not just doing it for themselves. We don't get paid to do this. They're getting paid to create these confrontations. And the government is 
manipulating this whole situation. And we saw it at Gustafson Lake. We saw how the media controlled and spinned everything at Gustafson Lake. Um, we don't want to see the same thing happening now. I mean, this is how many years later, since 1995, um, there should be some more ethical ways to do reporting for Indigenous people. And that's why we, you know, appreciate this platform that you give us today. And we need um, Canadian, other Canadians the, out there to stand up with us back when they were in the, in the days when they were abolishing slavery, it took white people to stand up too. This is not just an indigenous issue. We need people to stand up and stand with us because we are fighting a, a violent colonial state and they're using the indigenous affairs, the Department of Indian Affairs, the Crown indigenous Crown Relations to um, push forward with the pipeline and using the Indian Act chiefs to make it look like there's consent for this pipeline when there's not. There's obviously not full 100% collective consent from the Sokwapmuk people. And that's why we make our decision and our governing process here in Sokwapmuk Ulu is by the people's assemblies that take place. <clears throat> and <clears throat> July 25th, we're going to see uh, people coming to our back entrance. Um, the back entrance, we have erected rocks um, going down because of all the trucks that have been trying to ram our, our wooden barricades. We've had uh, like, uh, I don't know what to call them, sawhorses, you know, construction sawhorses, and we'll put our big plywood signs in front of them. So Kwamuk safe zone, no trespassing. Um, to, to people know that we're creating a, a safe space for land defenders and our families because our children are there with us. Our mothers are there, our grandmothers are there with us. So we wanna make it safe when people are walking to the outhouse that they don't have to get um, jump out of the way to from trucks ramming down the road. Like, no, we need to create that safe space. And land defenders are asserting our Aboriginal title and rights. These are inherent rights. These are even constitutionally protected rights here in Canada. So we are asserting our rights. And they're saying, if we don't use our land, we're going to lose our land. And that's why we are there. And we're not going to be strong armed or punked out of our land. We're not going to do that. We've we've been pushed away from our land and removed from our land every time. We've been forced onto these holding pens called Indian reserves. And now through all these Supreme Court cases on title and rights, they're saying what we've already been saying, we can exclusively use and occupy our territories. That means living on our lands. And so when we do that, we are threatened with violence. And every week we've been faced with this. This is going to be the 10th week of these hate rallies that are being organized against us. And there's anywhere from 10 to 20 people, sometimes 30 people. Now <clears throat> they are escorted, escorted by the RCMP, um, regular local RCMP from Clearwater, as well as the division liaison team who are self-identified um, First Nations or Indigenous people. Uh, who are RCMP as well. And then the Community Industry Response Group, who's another RCMP um, division. So there's three police agencies within the RCMP that are constantly harassing and surveilling tiny house warriors and Sokwapmuk land defenders. And we want to bring attention to this. Um, the Amnesty International and the Union of BC Indian Chiefs <clears throat> both wrote letters to Jennifer Strachan of the E Division of the RCMP, who is the, the head commander. And she's the one that held the, the raid against the Wet'suwet'en as well. And we want to address this. These chiefs um, are creating a lot of damage. I don't even want to call them chiefs. A lot of people across Canada, Native people across Canada have uh, messaged me to make sure that I do not acknowledge them as chief and counsel when we're talking about the Indian Act chief and counsel system, rather call them Indian agents or civil servants to the crown because that's what they really are. Um, they're not looking at the best interest of us. They're not looking at the best interest of our collective Sopatmuk nation and our geographical land base. Um, they're only looking out for their interest that they signed with the Trans Mountain Pipeline. And I, both of this, the hate rally and, and the INAC chiefs, um, going against us or go hand in hand because it's all a ploy by the federal and the provincial government. They're the ones that are creating the dissension. 
um, our, we have relatives in Sim. They're our family. We've never been confined to one reservation. We've traveled all throughout our nation. And so these are our relatives that are doing this to us. And this is what we see when resource extraction companies come into our area. People want to look at the environmental impacts. No one is really talking about the social impacts that this causes because this division that they're creating is civil unrest within our nation. It's, a, it's breaking our family kinship laws in our nation um, where we don't, we don't do this to each other and our relatives, meaning our salmon, our bear, so our caribou, our moose, not just the human relatives, our, all of our relatives, that's a part of our laws, so common people. And so it's very serious and our elders have written a very strong statement out to our nation and are calling for a massive Sukhwatmuk assembly that the elders are now raising funds to be able to host. We don't want to accept any federal funding for our, our, our nation meetings, our nationhood meetings. And these are the continuation of the meetings that, that my father was a part of, my grandfather was a part of, all the times, even Andy Paul coming from, from the coast and even Chief Dan George coming from the coast. We're still working with our relatives, Will George, you know, Andy Paul's nephew and Reuben George, you know, Jan, Grand, or da, Chief Dan George's family. Like we're still doing this family, this work, it hasn't stopped. We come from a very connected network of, of indigenous land defenders and fighters all across Canada. Um, you can't just come into these circles. You have to be in here for generations and generations to have the trust of the rest of the people in Canada, Indigenous people in Canada. And I believe that my family has worked very hard to become educators and experts in the field of Indigenous title and rights to speak on this issue. And we're going to continue to see this because when you're talking about sharing the wealth of a pie, they're so used to taking the whole pie, the wealth of our lands. And then when we start to say, hey, no, we're gonna take a piece of this, we're gonna live on this over here, we're gonna take a piece here, um, they're threatened. And it's, my sister says it goes beyond racism. It goes beyond that, it's, the, it's that we're the title holders to the land. And that by acknowledging and having to acknowledge this truth that we are the title holders to the land, they have to acknowledge that they're here um, settled on lands that they don't have the clear title to and that is threatening to a lot of people. And I believe that's where the fear is coming from. That's where the fear from these white people that are holding these hate rallies are coming from. Because I heard some of them say, I'm here because I could hunt, I could drink clean water and I could raise my grandchildren in this fresh, clean, pristine land. Yes, exactly. That's exactly why we are here but they don't want us to be able to enjoy the wealth of our territory because they say, we got to pay for our rent and you're occupying crown land and you don't have to pay for a damn thing. They say, no, we pay for it. We pay for it with our blood, sweat and tears because we can't just live on our land without a fight. And that's what we're seeing. And this is what, what is being exposed right now is that we're here for two and a half years and now um, they're finally starting to rally this hate against us um, and we're going to see it happen tomorrow and we're going to document it and we're going to start off with a beautiful ceremony to give the power and the strength back to our people well we're going to all be paying attention uh you know to see what's going on with this hate rally against the tiny house warriors you know you said this is the 10th rally that people have been organizing against you um you said these are paid rallies um, we have no idea who's organizing. I know some of the names. I don't know if I'm going to say it out loud here. Uh, I post some of the pictures and of some of the organizers on my Facebook. Um, but <clears throat> they're definitely pro-pipeline because right. many times when I went up to them to confront them and ask their intention being here, they have agreed, mm -hmm. yes, they are pro-pipeline. Mm -hmm. Kanahus, can you tell us a little bit? I know you you know you must be sick and tired of talking about this, but talk about the extension. Talk about the Trans Mountain Extension Pipeline. What exactly are they bringing in thousand men in a camp? And then after this, we'll talk about man camps again.
Yeah. But, well, you know, what exactly does this pipeline look like? Paint a picture for people who maybe haven't been paying attention. Um, for people that don't know about the Alberta tar sands, where this bitumen that they want to flow through these pi this pipe um, pipeline is coming from, the Alberta tar sands is one of the biggest um, carbon bombs in North America uh, or the world. And mm -hmm. they've been mining bitumen deep into the earth. It's a very destructive toxic process. They have tailings ponds um, just meters away from rivers and up in and around the uh, Fort McMurray and the Alberta tar sands area. And our relatives have been, you know, educating us for a decade on the impacts that the Alberta tar sands have had on the health of the indigenous people in the area. I mean, drinking water quality, hunting, fishing, it's, it's all being poisoned and toxic at this point, yet people continue to pick the berries. Native people up there in the north, um, tar, tar sands impacted communities continue to harvest all the wild foods that we've always harvested since the beginning. And they're being impacted. I mean, skin lesions are a normal occurrence on children there from bathing in the water that they have hooked up to their homes. Um, a lot of communities are on drink water advisory. Some of the babies have only bathed in, in, in water bottle, bottled water. They have never bathed in water that they could turn on from the taps. Um, so this is where the pipeline is coming from. The pipeline Trans Mountain is coming from the Edmonton Terminal, from the Alberta Tar Sands to the Edmonton Terminal, uh, Trans Mountain Edmonton Terminal in Sherwood, right outside of Edmonton, and then pipe through pipes, underground, under rivers, under creeks, all the way from the Edmonton Terminal through Jasper, um, beautiful park, Mount Robson. These are the some of the pristine mountains you see when you see uh, beautiful British Columbia or beautiful Mount snow-capped glacier mountains from Canada. That's in our territory. That's in Sequatmuk Uluk. That's in the Rocky Mountains. And that's exactly where this pipeline is planning on heading. And they want to pipe this pipeline 1,140 42 kilometers or 52 kilometers to the West Ridge Marine Terminal out there to the Coast Salish territories, the Tisleiwatooth, Squamish, Musqueam territories. And this is a marine terminal. And so they want to pop this all the way through our lands, 518 kilometers of our pristine lands through Sequatmuk Uluk. And these are pristine lands. These are um, actually, this pipeline wants to cross under over a thousand rivers, creeks, and streams from Westridge Marine Terminal to Edmonton Terminal. It's like that much waterways that they want to cross. My nation is the land of the spilling waters. That's what it's referred to because there's so much glaciers, there's so much water, there's so much underground water and springs, hot springs, lakes. It has the deepest glacier flood lake in the world in our territory. And this is what we don't want to risk. Um, this, if you look and you go to any social media and you hashtag oil riggers or oil rig culture, you're going to see what type of culture that oil riggers and this pipeline industry um, manufacture because it's not healthy and it's not normal. When you start putting thousands of men together with this get the job done type of mentality and you know, knowing contractors in my life and them telling me when you're a contractor, your job is to cut corners. And when you cut corners, you do a shoddy job. You don't do the best top grade job there is. And that's the type of work that we're going to see along this pipeline. I mean, this is rugged terrain. You look at any of the old archives or chronicles when the Hudson Bay Company came through or the Canadian Pacific Railway came through or the Yellowhead Highway came through. You know, the Trans Mountain original pipeline was built in 1951 um, so and approved before we could even say no to this pipeline. So what we see is a pristine environment being threatened for this pipeline. And they dig deep into the earth to put these pipes. They have stockpiles right now up and down the pipeline corridor. They have stockpiles in Belmont, Bavenby. They have stockpiles in Edson that they say can, that could build the pipeline all the way to, to Belmont. So they have the stockpiles and they have man camps 
in Belmont and Clearwater, which is both north and south of us, which were the smaller man camps that they wanted to build, the 500 man man camps. And those are both built there. They've had uh, extensive you know, opposition from the local residents as well because of their concern right now. Clearwater is actually um, applying, the Clearwater Trans Mountain Man Camp is actually applying for an alcohol permit for inside the Clearwater Trans Mountain Man Camp that some of the local residents are also opposing um, on top of the Indigenous people opposing this. And what we see when you, when you think of a man camp and you see all these thousands of men coming together that are working at these industries. A lot of these men are transient men from around the world, not just in, in Canada, because some of the contractors are from London, England. Some of the contractors to build this pipeline are from Paris, France. So even throughout COVID-19, they're still allowing these contractors to come in because they're saying it is an essential service to build this pipeline. COVID-19 never stopped the work here in Trans Mountain. They continue to work, they continue to haul the pipes, they continue to build up the stockpiles and man camp prep preparation. And we believe that this is wrong because Indigenous people, we faced so much um, <clears throat> epidemics that has de decimated our population. And for these Trans Mountain to continue to work with the high Indigenous population population around these man camp area or these trans mountain pipeline proposed areas and man camps um, we say that it's genocide it's continuing on with the genocide of our people not taking in consideration our health and our well-being in our territories and looking at pipelines and this pipeline business as being um, the number one consideration for for Trudeau and putting any effort into into BC is the only effort he's putting in is for these pipelines and that they're calling in more RCMP to come on site while there was Aisha Hudson murdered by the police, there was Chantal Moore murdered by the police and Indigenous women continue to be murdered by the RCMP here in Canada with no big, huge, major outrage like we would like to see for our Indigenous women and girls. And this is what we see. You you attack our women and girls, where's the outrage? You, would, you murder tens of thousands of Indigenous people here in Canada, um, where's the outrage? You attack Indigenous female um, land defenders, where's the outrage? We need people to be outraged about this in order to do something. Lift your vibration to the levels that will push you to that courage to stand up with us because we do need people on the front line. And it may not be here in the tiny house warriors at our homes, but there's 1,152 kilometers of pipeline that needs to be stopped. And we encourage people to get out there to do with their affinity groups to do uh, uh, anonymous direct actions to stop this pipeline. Um, that's the only way that we're going to stop this pipeline is to delay as much as we can because it's going to cost them money every time it's delayed, every year. The first year it's delayed, they're not going to make money. They're going to start act operating in the red, and operating in the negative. And this is why we're getting so much hate is because our campaign against this pipeline is being successful. We are shaking this boat. We are rattling this country up because we are saying we are not going to be confined to the Indian reserves um, anymore. We're stepping outside of those holding pens where you've held us for so long and we're taking our land back and they're, they're not going to like it. My father said, they are going to be very, 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 very angry and upset over this, but it's not genocide that they're feeling. Okay. Thank you. I'm still here. I just relocated. Okay. I was led into the house. <laughs> oh. <laughs> nice. But um, yeah, I mean, I just think, you know, these things, I'm sure, you know, this is nothing to you, but these things that we normalize, like missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls, how that's become a hashtag. Like that, that's a hashtag. It's, you know, it's an ongoing travesty, genocide, crisis that's just being normalized. And it's the same thing with this idea of men. Like that we can even accept that there's such thing as thousands of men being, 
you know, living together, like you said, transient, which means they come and they go, right? There's no accountability to place. Mm -hmm. There's no accountability to community. There's no accountability to the land. Um, so you've been constantly raising the flag on man camps and talking about the correlation of increased violence against women due to having this, you know, conglomerate of men, you know, drinking, work, making money, focus on money. How much money are, are these workers making? Um, the first, I think the first paid job that they're getting, like $70,000. Like, so somebody could graduate from high school, then go get a $70,000 um, a year job and that's just their starting wage like you're going up to like hundreds of hundred thousand dollar career for driving those tar sands trucks and so we're going to see our losing our men and losing our women um, a brain drain from our nation to work for the Alberta tar sands and industries like that because of the money but our people should be wealthy in itself because the amount of money that Canada owes us in compensation is that no Indigenous person should ever have to work. They make enough money off of the royalties to our land. You know, that's, no person should have to ever work and compromise our land for that. And that's what we want to show, that this is not just the Indigenous rights um, fight. This is an economic fight for yeah. our Indigenous economies. And our Indigenous economies are decreasing and the devaluing with the construction of this pipeline. This pipeline wants to say it's bringing economics and, and into economy, into this, to, into the into BC. It's actually devaluing our indigenous economies that already exist, our salmon, our moose, our untouched water, our, all of this, it's devaluing it. So that's not a good business and venture for us to get into. And there's some of these um, Sukhwatmuk men that are actually threatening to purchase 51% of this pipeline using Indian trust funds to do it as a loan. And so this is actually happening. It was published in um, Boston Scientific Journal um, about this Indian trust fund. You never hear about it anywhere else except for when they want to give Native people money to buy a pipeline with it. Um, it's, so it's very dangerous. This is a very uh, lucrative sneaky business dealings that are happening here on the ground here in Sukhwamuk Uluk. Um, but to bring it to back to the man camps, um, they are very violent and a lot of women are reaching out to us to give their testimonials about the violence that they have faced and even being kidnapped into the, the human trafficking rings that, that uh, frequent up there and actually target girls, native girls, and bring them up to areas around the Alberta tar sands. I mean, we've seen it. They, they, there was testimonials on um, national newspapers here in Canada, even with women disclosing what happens in and around the sex trade industries around the man camp, around the tar sands. So yeah, it is very scary, especially when our young women are are vulnerable and they are, are the most targeted. They're most over police, but they're most underprotected here in Canada. And so our women, we're going to continue to see our women targeted if we allow these man camps and these industries to come. Right now, there's 500 men that checked into hotels in and around Kamloops. Um, so Scott, the Scott Motor Inn is one of them where they're going to be, I think they took in 300 Trans Mountain workers. And so they're housing these men in hotels in Kamloops and they're going to be housing them in Merit as well and some other of these places along the route. So that's really dangerous too. It's like people don't even know that these men are coming in. They came in, we heard firsthand because we've had uh, somebody staying at the Scots Inn that the owner said, well, we got a big order. Everyone has to move out because the man camp or the trans mountain workers are moving in. Very scary. There's you you drive the drive the streets of of Kamloops. You're going to see that the type of vulnerable um, girls that are out there right now, and they're colored and they're native, and we care about them because they're our relatives. These are all our relatives that are out there, and and as tiny house warriors, we're not just about looking after and fighting against the pipeline. We're birth workers and we're healers, and and we work with um, you know 
victims of sexual trauma. Um, that's the type of work my family has done all along. We're, we're healers and, and my grand, great grandfathers and my great grandparents were all healers, not just uh, medicinal herbal healers, but psychological. They were like psychiatrists for our people. And mm -hmm. so we're continuing on this work, even on the front line. Um, we're continuing to do this work. I mean, babies want to be born on the front line. His mothers are asking if I would deliver their babies on the front line. And so I say, yes, I will deliver your babies on the front line because that's the way that we are. We don't stop um, living. You know, we can keep on doing this work and we're going to continue to have babies. And so I continue to do my other work, my tattoo ceremonies on the front lines. I've tattooed many faces and many chins of uh, many warrior women on the front line. So this is the beautiful things that are coming out of our our village there at Tiny House Warriors, and we're not going to back down. And we believe that the way that we combat it is also with the love of our people. You know, we combat that hate, and we know as our people that the vibrations of love are a lot stronger than hate. And and that's the way that we're going to do it, because right now I have three children here. I have my two children listening to me and, and my little baby niece, um, and we bring them on the front line. and. It's powerful because there are going to be stronger leaders than us today. And we're going to see that happen. Um, and we want to show the world that we, we aren't violent. We aren't violent, but we will defend ourselves. We're not scared to defend ourselves. Right. Well, you know, just to kind of come full circle here, I saw that you, you know, you did a, an outreach asking for people that you have to consider we stand with Tiny House Warrior. Um, what's your message you know, to supporters, community members? You know, what's your message? What would you like to see? What would you like to hear and feel? Yeah, we would like to see everybody use their social media accounts right now to support us, to say, make a sign. I support Tiny House Warriors. I stand with Tiny House Warriors. Um, and take a picture and share it to all your social medias and hashtag um, Tiny House Warriors. We have a website, tinyhousewarriors.com, and this is where you can make a donation. Um, this is you could get a tax receipt even for this donation. It's it's being raised through our 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 partner organization, the Seven Generation Fund for Indigenous Peoples down in Arcata, California, who've been nice enough to um, open this up to allow us to raise funds through them. So we have no. Um, issues because I know they blocked a lot of funds that were coming in at Standing Rock and stuff and Seven Generation Fund helped them so please donate through our website that's a way that that we could continue to to receive funds um, we're going to be starting a build we're going to be actually tomorrow purchasing two trailers um, two trailers that we're going to be built on so we're going to have two more houses being built within this next month um, we have builders that are coming and volunteering to build. It's, it's all volunteer builders that, that come and volunteer their time, amazing builders. And this is a way that they want to fight the pipeline. Um, we're going to be continuing on our actions against the insurance companies, Chubb Insurance and Mutual Liberty Mutual or Mutual Liberty, Liberty Mutual. And we're going to continue um, addressing CERD, sure, the community, Committee on the Elimination of All Forms of Racial Discrimination and inviting the, the Human Rights Rapporteur to come here to Suquamuk Uluk to witness firsthand the human rights violations happening at the hands of Canada. Um, we need people to continue to share this, to keep their eyes on the front line. This helps to, to keep us safe out there. And address the RCMP because the, and the Canadian government, if you feel obligated to write to um, the the politicians that may be involved with this Trans Mountain Pipeline, write them, you know, on our on on our behalf. Say that you know about Tiny House Warriors. Say hands off. Don't criminalize us. Don't assault us. We have four four court cases, trials coming up. We are facing criminal charges for actions against um, Trans Mountain Pipeline. Um, three of the charges and three of the people are facing charges from the third failed consultation, consultation process where they hired the retired Supreme Court Justice Frank Iacobucci to handle the third round of consultation. It failed their first day into the consultation. Three Indigenous people were arrested for saying no to this pipeline. Um, 
we are going to continue um, looking at our legal options abroad um, over in Europe. What are some of our legal options? And we want to file some lawsuits against companies over in Europe that have interest in our land without our consent. And so we're looking at different um, ways to come at them. But I want to say that one of the brothers down in um, Oglala Lakota, when they're fighting the pipeline down there, he talked about Crazy Horse. And he, we were standing there amongst the storm was all around us. And there was lightning strikes all around the hills around us. And he said, this is what Crazy Horse did. Crazy Horse looked at the elements of the earth on how to fight. And he saw these lightning strikes and he saw it hit there, then he saw it hit on the over here and there, everywhere. It never hit in one spot. And he said, that's the way that we need to fight. We need to fight like those, like these storms that come in and lightning strikes hitting this pipeline from every angle and hitting it and then attacking it and killing it from every angle um, is what's going to kill it, not just tiny house warriors fighting it from this angle and fighting it on the ground. We're going to have everybody involved and this is what we see is we see thousands and tens of thousands of people fighting the oil and gas industry right now um, one of the wins and one of the attacks that we did was against um, Zurich the Trans Mountain's lead insurance company that dropped its insurance coverage on Trans Mountain and we hope that insurance companies around the world will also follow suit and drop their coverage to Trans Mountain and any Alberta tar sands related infrastructure as well and we're going to continue going to Europe um, even during COVID-19 we're going to continue our meetings through Zoom with these international insurance companies and banks and continue to educate them on their risks and the uncertainty of investing in the Trans Mountain Pipeline or tar sands um, related mining or infrastructure. And we see major companies over in Europe, the big insurance companies and international banks divesting out of the coal industry and the big coal power plants. And that's a big push. Now it's the Alberta tar sands. And so with enough pressure from all the NGOs, enough pressure from the grassroots organizers and the environmental activists and social justice organizers, we hope that we can um, shut down Trans Mountain Pipeline with everybody hitting and attacking, fighting Trans Mountain and killing it from every angle, every skill set that you have be deployed right now. Um, whatever it may be, you have a good idea, um, execute it. Let's, let's join and let's fight this. This is gonna be a united fight. Uh, on a united front from all of us to fight this pipeline. Thank you. Fight like crazy horse. Mm -hmm. Fight like the mm -hmm. thing. Who do you it's have my, there? <laughs> it's, my, it's my daughter. <laughs> Hi. Uh, and my niece. They're both here. They're both tiny house warriors. Yeah. Risotto, come here. <laughs> It's one of the best martial arts uh, oh. <laughs> teachers in Brazil. Oh, wow. So let's, try get, let's try and get him to the Tiny House Warriors to do some self defense. I'll, he doesn't yeah. speak English, but I'll explain to him. Hey, you know, we should do like even an online Zoom seminar and we can just even watch watch and do some talk uh -huh. about the, the training, talk, talk about been... self defense. Ela guerreira muito famosa lá no Canadá. Ela guerreira muito famosa, o pai dela muito famosa, o avô dela muito famosa. Sempre lutando por os direitos, por as famílias. E ela quer que você ensine as mulheres, porque são mulheres que estão protegendo a terra, né? Então, ela quer fazer algo por Zoom, por as, as mulheres indígenas. Algo de capoeira? Algo de capoeira, de self-defense. Defense. Vamos aí, vamos fazer yeah, he said he can give. Yes, he can give classes. Yes. 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 Yeah. <laughs> he comes. He comes from a long line, kind of. He comes from a long line. His his family is is really big in their spirituality here, indigenous and Afro kind of play culture here where I am. And he, you know, he's well known all over Brazil for basically fly because he does all kinds of you know capoeira, martial arts. And, 
Oh, it's, yeah, we're, I'm learning lessons to bring back north. Yeah, good. Yeah, we're ready. Like I will produce my own. Traz, ali traz o funcionamento da pessoa que querer mais se fortalecer, né? Tem que uma consciência de fazer um processo especial para poder ficar aqui e dar essa nova questão para correr. He said he'll make a special class for folks who are on the front there in self-defense. Yes. Um, I've been working a little bit with him with like how to disarm someone and how to, you know, know your way around because this is the state that we're at right now. You know, you've been you've been in this your whole life, but it's like, you know, it's it's intense. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So yeah. he'll yeah, our women need to feel safe. Our women need to feel safe. And this is going to give them the, the um, courage. And this is going to give them the knowledge to be able to defend themselves. So it's going to give so much power to women. Ela falou, não mulheres precisam se sentir seguras, porque não se sentem seguras. Está matando elas. E ela falou que você precisa dar confidência. Está muito aí. O mundo gira, cuida a roda. É. Juntos, vamos aqui. He's in. <laughs> okay. Hey, Sorry. and you, we have like an MMA, or he used to be a UFC fighter, a former UFC fighter, Cajun Johnson. He's going to be coming up tomorrow, and he's going to be there with us. Tome, que é famoso, o UFC, que faz o UFC. E ele vai chegar amanhã, onde ele está, porque tem Thing is the, like, uh, yeah, yeah. Let's go. <laughs> it's good. All right, Kanahus, thank you so much for the update. Uh, but let's check in with you as much as feels right. We can check in every week. You know, all okay. eyes are on the front line. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Okay. And thanks for the support. Take care. Bye. Bye. Bye, little ones. Bye. <laughs> little warriors. <laughs>